said to the Baptist boy, what does that mean? And the Baptist boy says, nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. It won't take you long to find out I'm a NASCAR fan. I'm not as much as... After Dale Earnhardt died, I kind of lost a lot of, a lot of desire to watch. But I grew up in western North Carolina and a lot of those guys, you know, at Hickory Speedway. Hickory Speedway is known as the home of NASCAR stars because so many of those guys who raced at Hickory Speedway turned out to be NASCAR champions. The Jarretts and uh, Harry Gant and Morgan Shepard and just to name a few. I'm having a hard time hearing. I'm sorry. Oh. Should I stand closer? Or maybe they can oh. sound louder. I'm can, sorry. Are, is it, do I need to adjust where this is? Can you hear me now? Can, can you hear me now? Is this Verizon or Sprint or what? Okay. <laughs> Uh, as one year in, in the mid 80s, and I can't even remember what race it was, but it was the Daytona 500, probably you know one of the most prestigious races uh, in in the world. Uh, and at the beginning of the third lap, one of the best drivers and one of the fastest cars slowed and went into the infield. And they couldn't figure out what in the world was going on. Had he blown an engine? Uh, and finally they got into the pits and they checked and guess what they found out? There was no gas in the car. Now we're talking about a machine that's worth half a million dollars. We're talking about one of the best race drivers, one of the best crews, one of the best car builders. You know, in NASCAR. And guess what they found out? They had plenty of gas in the pits, but somebody had forgotten to put gas in the car. Can you imagine how embarrassing that was during that most prestigious race, 7.5 miles into the race, and he's already out of gas. He's out of contention. He's done for the day. He's cooked, or he kept racing. And I think that illustrates how we are as Christians. Many of us are trying to run this race of life without being filled with the power that it takes to be a Christian. And that is the power that the Holy Spirit provides. Jesus promised that each Christian would not be left with an empty tank, but be, would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, just for those of you who don't know, this is the last Sunday of Easter. Easter? Yes, it's the last Sunday of the season of Easter. It began with the, the resurrection of Jesus and it ends 50 days later. And that is the Jewish uh, festival of Pentecost. And that's 50 days after the Jewish Passover when Jesus was killed. And so, uh, and just a couple of uh, 10 days or so before Jesus has ascended into heaven, and as he ascends into heaven, he says, you know, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He says, but before you do that, wait. Go to Jerusalem until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And so today is the day that we celebrate the coming of the Holy Spirit. And for many, it is the birth of the church. Uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to read our text for this morning. It's in Acts 2, 1 to 13. But before that, I want to give us some background. And if you don't have your Bible, you need to start writing some of this down. Or, or, you know, or you, if you've got a good memory, not me... Uh, but I'm going to give you uh, some background to help you to understand why this day is so important. In Genesis 1.27, the Bible says that God created human beings, male and female. He made them in his own image. Now, what is that image? Is it male and female? No. John 4.24 says that God is spirit. God is spirit. The spirit of a holy God cannot live in sin. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, God forced them from his presence in the garden. Uh, and, and, and they lost their eternal life. They were, from as far as we know, uh, they were never going to die. They were eternal. Uh, we're not sure about all that. Uh, so after that, though, God sets out to redeem humanity. He created humanity for a purpose, and God is going to fulfill His purpose. So He sets out to redeem them. Romans 5, 14, and 15 says that 
sin entered into humanity through the first Adam. Now in Hebrew, the word Adam is Hadam. And that merely means human, human being. So it's not like a name like Bruce. Adam is not a, a, a name like that. It is, he created human beings, and that is Hadam. And, and all of the members of, of us were born in that race. Uh, we're sinful. And yet God then created a new Adam, Jesus Christ. And all of us now can be born into that new race. So you're either in the old race, the first Adam, sinful, or we're born into the new Adam race, Jesus race. And God gives us grace. He gives us justification. He gives us righteousness. He gives us eternal life. Uh, Jesus is the first of a new race. He is a human being. But he is also completely filled with the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that before Pentecost, human beings, the Spirit was with man, but now he is in man. And so Jesus was the first human being completely filled with the Holy Spirit. So now we then are to become members of this new race. I, people come up to me all the time and said, Oh, I'm just a human being. I can't help but sin all the time. That's just who I am. I'm just an old sinner. Let me tell you something, folks. If you're just an old sinner, you're going to hell one day. And some of you are more concerned than I said the word hell than the fact that you may be going there. You see, because if you are still of Adam's race, you're going to die in your sins. You have to become a part of this new race, this new creation, this new people, this Jesus race. Human beings completely filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus, the Bible says, is the firstborn of this new race. And we can be conformed to His image. We can be made into the image of God. It says that in Romans 8 and 29. Everyone born again becomes a member of this new creation. Uh, the Spirit of God is put in us. We are no longer of the first Adam. Now I want you to repeat that after me. I am no longer of the first Adam. Say it. I am a new creature. I am of the race of Jesus Christ. Now you said it, I want to make sure you believe it. <laughs> okay? We're going to work on that this morning. So, we are born again into this new race, this Jesus race. We're no longer of the first Adam sinful, but we bear the image of the second Adam, this one who has the ability because of the Spirit indwelling in Him to live a life pleasing to God. Not to be controlled and enslaved to sin, but to have the power of the Holy Spirit to live a life above sin. Now, does that mean that we lose the capability of sinning? No, because we're still human. But what it does mean is that we lose the, the have to. 1 Corinthians 15 says that we have been given the Holy Spirit and God then gives us the ability to live a life pleasing to Him. So we as human beings filled with the Holy Spirit of God, we can live in the same way that Jesus did. You say, oh, I can't live like Jesus. He was Jesus. Well, you are like Jesus. If you are born again and you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are like Jesus. You are a part of this new race. You have the capability because of the power of the Spirit in you. What power is that? It's the same Spirit that created the world. All the world was created by the Holy Spirit. Same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is in you. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Whew, you're a tough crowd. If this was a Pentecostal church, I'd be picking you off the ceiling. Did you just hear what I said? You have been redeemed. You are a member of a new race. You are no longer controlled by sin. No longer. You don't have to be. 
You, you might choose to be, but you don't have to be. There is no temptation but such as is common to man. That means that nobody gets temptation any worse than anybody else. There is no temptation but such as common to man. And God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide you the means of escape. Now if that's true, that's 1 Corinthians 15. If that's true, then do we have to sin? Everybody shake your head like this. You don't have to because God don't, doesn't allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. He always provides a way of escape. Now, the choice that we then make is whether or not we're listening and whether or not we allow the Holy Spirit to see the way of escape and we are able to elude sin. That's our choice. Not because you have to. People say, oh, I'm just an old sinner. I can't help but sin. You, if you say that to me, you'll see my neck get red. And it'll go all the way up through here because it makes me mad because we are claiming something that the devil would love to have us believe that you don't have any choice but to sin. And that's, that's exactly against what the Bible says. You are no longer in that first Adam race. You are in the second Adam race. You are, you are created in the image of Jesus. Amen. I told you last week, if I don't think you're getting it and you're not letting me know that you're getting it, at least nod your head every once in a while, I'm going to keep preaching until I think you get it, okay? Please, because I mean, I, listen, if you need a second cup of coffee, we'll, we'll bring it in on Sunday mornings. That's what you need, okay? So stay with me. This is it. I listen, I get, people have said that when they hear this for the first time and they understand it, it, it makes a, a, all the difference in the world in their life. And I think it will for you today as well. So, on the day of Pentecost, human beings then became a part of this new race. Now, if you want to turn with me to Acts chapter 2, I'm going to, I'm going to read that section of, of Scripture for you. Then, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly, from heaven, there came the sound of the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house uh, where they were sitting. Dividing tongues uh, of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were devout uh, Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem. And at the sound of the a crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one of them heard them speaking the native language of each of them there, amazed and astonished. They ask, are all of these who are speaking not Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in our own language? Uh, Parthians, Mede, Edomites, and the residents of Mesopotamia, Judah, and Cappadocia, Porteus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia. You getting all that? Uh, just, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, wanted to see, I wanted to check and see what she was doing with all those words. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and, and Rome and Jews and, and all kinds of proselytes. Uh, there were Cretans and Arabs, uh, in, but in our own language, we hear them speak about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others said, well, these guys are filled with wine. Well, they were filled with wine, but it was new wine. God promised that he would not, Jesus promised he would not leave us alone at the ascension when he goes into heaven. Amen. 10, 12 days. Thank you. <laughs> I know somebody's listening. <laughs> uh, he, he tells them, here's what I want you to do. There are only four or five things Jesus tells us to do. And one of them is Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Go into all... The word there is ta ethane. It's the word that we get our, our uh, English word ethnic. So a better translation of that would be to go to all kinds of people. How many of you think you're going to go to Africa someday? Got one? 
how many are going to go to uh, Russia and Asia and say, well, probably, probably never get to. So that, that takes me off the hook. Matthew 28, 18 to 20, I don't have to worry about because I'm never going to go to all those nations. But if the word is ta'ethane, all kinds of people, how many of you live around all kinds of people? Some of you are crippled, I know, and you can't raise your hand. But <laughs> See, at least I know you're listening when you raise your hand. All right, good, thank you. So, so you see, that puts us all on the hook for the Great Commission. But Jesus says, okay, I, I told you what to do now, but don't go do it. How's that? Go to Jerusalem. Wait. Until you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and in Acts it says, we know that they weren't Baptists because it says they were all in one room in one accord. <laughs> Amen. Thank you, Jesus. So they were there and, and, and then, you know, during that week of Pentecost uh, celebration, they're there in that room together and they're filled with the Holy Spirit. So what did the disciples receive? Any of you ever received an inheritance? Some of you have. Like this if you have. Or like this if you haven't. Or I don't know what you're talking about, preacher. Those are the three answers you can always give me. Yes, no, or I have no idea what you're talking about. Now, I know what this one is. So I've got that one, but those are the other three. So what did they get? They got an inheritance. Either you're a sole heir, means that you get everything in the inheritance, or you are a joint heir. Um, my mother and father died in the last couple of years, and my siblings and I became joint heirs, which meant that we divided what was left among all of us. The Bible calls us joint heirs with Jesus, which means we receive the same inheritance that He does. That's one of those. I mean, you know, amen. You, here's how I know what denomination you are. If you're, if you're Baptist, you might go like this. If you're in the early service like you are, you're supposed to at least be able to do this. Uh, if you're Pentecostal, you'll do this. And if you're charismatic, you'll do that. So any one of those, you can also do those, and I'll understand what's going on out there, okay? So in, in this thing, when you realize that you have become joint heirs with Jesus and you receive the same inheritance as He is, it ought to be this. Because, the, I mean, it, if you really think about what that means, it ought to not only boggle your mind, but it ought to cause your heart to explode and say, Hallelujah, what has happened to me? I have been made joint heirs with Jesus. I'm going to receive the same inheritance as He is. Now, you say, well, that means I'm going to heaven. It's great that one day you're going to heaven. But if you don't go to heaven in the next five minutes, you're going to have to stay here on this earth and you're going to have to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. So if you're going to have to do that, then you better be filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Amen, Brother Bruce. How big of a coffee urn can we put out here before people come in? Or, or what else do we need? I don't know. Chocolate? I'll pass out chocolate if that's what you need. Chocolate! Amen, brother. <laughs> there we go. Some of you are figuring it out. So, so we not only get heaven, but we get the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We, we said, and that does a couple of things. First of all, it's a lifelong process whereby we allow the Holy Spirit to make us into the image of Jesus Christ. So one day when we go into heaven, all the angels are going to look at us as we come in and they're going to ooh, and they're going to ah, and they say, how much like Jesus they look. And they act and they talk. Because you see, we've allowed the Spirit, and, and the big word for that is sanctification. Sanct means to be made holy. 
So we allow the Holy Spirit to make us holy. So He makes us into the image of Jesus Christ. Second, He empowers us to do what God has called us to do. Matthew 28, 18, 20, Great Commission. For us Baptists, the biggie is love one another. Amen. <laughs> uh, we're supposed to love one another. The Bible says they will know whether or not we're Christians by how we love one another. That's the one where we ought to be saying, oh me. What does the world see when they see the way we treat each other sometimes? But the Spirit gives us the ability to love one another. So, uh, they got the Holy Spirit. They're joint heirs with Jesus. They've been, given, they've been given the power to be changed in the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, they've been given the power to do what God has called us to do. Um, so, Paul then calls us, on that day of Pentecost, what was created, he calls us the church of the firstborn. The church of the firstborn. Now that's not Adam. That's Jesus, the second Adam. This new race of human beings. Human beings completely filled with the Holy Spirit. And so we are this new church. We enter into the assembly of the firstborn. We become a part of this new creation. Uh, and, and the Bible image is, is one of, and I don't have my coat on so I can't do it. It's one where you take off your coat and, and, and you put on something else. You are a new creation. You take off this old dead self, this old sinner self. And the symbol that we use, especially in, in, in Baptist life, is we, we go into the waters of baptism. Baptism, that is a baptismal pool right there. Oh, good. So, and, and then we, we realize that we were dead in our sins. This old life is dead. So we take it and we bury it. And we come up out of the waters of baptism, resurrected into newness of life. Now, if you've got something dead hanging around your neck, that old dead self, what is something dead hanging around your neck going to do? Stink! Some of our lives as Christians stink because we've never gotten rid of that old dead sinner self. We keep saying, well, I'm just an old sinner. I can't help but sin some every day. That's a lie. You can because the Holy Spirit will allow you to do it, empower you to do it. That's a whole other sermon. We're not going to go there this morning. I'm looking at that clock. I'm going to watch for you, okay? All right, so we're in this new church. And then Peter in his sermon, now if you want to turn over to 2 uh, verses uh, 38 uh, to 39, it says this. Peter said to them, they say, what must we do? Peter says to them, repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, so that your sins may be forgiven, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, for your children, and for all who are far away, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to Him. Remember that one time Jesus said to Peter, I'm going to give you the keys of the kingdom? Guess what? Here they are. How many of you have more than one lock on your door? One, two, three, more than three. <laughs> Push a chair up against it at night. <laughs> I don't know. Woodstock doesn't seem to be a very crime-ridden place, but uh, uh, maybe it is. But but what? Working on it. <laughs> okay. So you've got more than one lock. So in order to get in your house, you've got to turn more than one key. Peter says here, in order to be in the kingdom of God, you have to have three keys. The keys of the kingdom. One key, repent. One lock. Two, be baptized. Second lock. Three, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Third lock. Now, if you unlock one lock, repent. Second lock, be baptized. And then try to open the door, what's going to happen? Does anybody know? You're not going to get in. In order to get in the door, you have to unlock all three locks. Christianity was meant to be all three. Repent, be baptized, be filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Anything less is not what God has intended for us. You see, because with just one and two, we're like that race car at Daytona 500. It has all the power, all the potential, great driver, great car, great engine, but no gas. And that's where most of us are. That's where the most of the church is. That's why we're not accomplishing what God has called us to accomplish because we're trying to do it ourselves. You ever seen those guys on pit road? The car runs out of gas and the pit crew runs out and how, how, well, they're all five pushing it. Now how fast is that thing going? Five miles an hour? And how long can they push that car? I don't know about you, but I can't push a car very long. It's, and it's gonna, they're going to die out. They're going to quit. They're gonna, <gasps> and, 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 and that's where we are in the church. Because we're relying on our own power to do what God has asked us to do. And we're wore out. We must learn to allow the power of the Holy Spirit that is within us to be the power that pushes us and enables us instead of just going five men pushing a car down the road, put some gas in that car and let that thousand horsepower thing fire up and go around the track at 200 miles an hour. That's the way we ought to be as human beings, saved by Jesus Christ. That's the way the church ought to be. We ought to be a powerhouse filled with the Spirit. Amen. Oh, me. And, and for all of us, we ought to be saying, oh me, because we're not doing it. We have not learned or been told. It's, it's like this. Did you know that last week when I was here, the first thing I did when I got back to Mechanicsville was I put $1,000 in a bank account for each one of you? What'd you do with it? Yeah, what else did you do with it? Can you get it out? No, first of all, you didn't even know it was there, did you? Second, I didn't give you the bank account number either. So there's that money just for you sitting there and you can't touch it. So that's the way most of us are as Christians. Jesus has put the Holy Spirit in us. It's there. It's ready. The power is there to make us into the image of Christ, make us new creatures, and to empower us to do God's work. And we don't know how to access it. If I look around here, I see some wall sockets around the room. Um, they look pretty innocuous. I think I'll go take my pen and stick it in one. What's going to happen when I do? I'm going to find out that there's power there, aren't I? <laughs> and my hair is going to stand up like this and my eyes are going to bug out because I find the source of the power. So it has been given to us. You don't have to go find it. When you're born again, you are filled with the Spirit of God. It's there. You don't have to go get it. You don't have to beg for it. It's there. All you need to do is learn how to access it. Now that's a lifelong process. I, I'm, I'm not going to say it's not. But we need to begin that process. And we need to allow the Holy Spirit to be the one that makes us into the image of Jesus Christ and makes us as individual Christians and as a church the power behind what needs to be done that He's called us to do. Great Commission. Love one another and those kinds of things. So, if you want to get into the kingdom, and there, doesn't everybody want to get into the kingdom? Listen, if you're waiting for, for somewhere down the line to get into the kingdom, you ain't going to make it. Because the Bible says the kingdom is now. The kingdom is within you. We enter the kingdom now. This, this thing that happens later, whatever all that means, you come into the kingdom now. And when all that happens, you just enter into the kingdom because you're already a member of it. The kingdom is where the king is. So where is the king? In here. We are the kingdom of God on this earth. And He has promised us to fulfill His mission through us. He left and said, okay, I'm turning it over to you. How are we doing? 
Any unsaved people in Woodstock? Any hurting people that don't know that there's a Christ that can, can make them whole? Anybody out there who's hurting and doesn't know what to do? Anybody out there who's sick and, and, and needs someone to comfort them? Anybody out there like that? We have within us the power of the Holy Spirit and the ability to minister to those people. And that's what we're called to do. Acts tells us that we are not what we think that we are. So we need to make sure that the three keys are happening in our life. Have you repented? And repent is not a, is not a religious word. It was a normal word. It meant you're walking down the road and all of a sudden you realize, you're, well, there's a lion down there. <laughs> We're walking down the road and you see that lion and you decide to turn around and go the other way. <laughs> That's what it means to repent. It means you're going down a road and you realize that it's not the right road for you. And you hear God's call to turn and come to Him and you turn around and go the other way. That's all it means. Repent. Be baptized. You realize that you are a slave to sin and you want God to change that. And you let Him kill that old sin nature in you. You take it into the baptismal pool. You bury it. And you come up out of that pool a new creature, no longer of the first Adam, but of the second Adam. A human being filled with the Spirit of God. Repent, be baptized, and then be filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> it, 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 there's a difference between having the Spirit in you and being filled with it. And, 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 and that's probably about four sermons. I'm not going to do that either this morning. But you need to know that you need to turn around and let that Spirit somehow engage you, allow that Spirit to begin to change you into the image of Jesus Christ minute by minute, day by day, and to empower you to do the work that God has called not only you but the church to do. We repent, we're baptized, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And we let the life of Jesus Christ live in and through us and when the world looks at us, they'll say, I see Jesus in them. Listen, that's the greatest anything that anything anybody can say about us as individuals or as a church. I see Jesus in them. Let's pray together. Father, we come here this morning and we realize that we have power that we have not used. That You have called us to a ministry that we are not fulfilling. We are a people who can be made into the image of Jesus Christ and we are not allowing that to happen. So Father, we ask for forgiveness, but we have heard Your truth today. And Lord, we believe it. We don't always know exactly what to do with it, but we ask that Your Spirit will energize us to let that Spirit within us make us into the image of Jesus Christ and empower us to be the people of God on mission. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. We're going to sing a song of um, invitation. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, come and repent and ask Him to come and, and, and energize your life. Christian, maybe today you realize that you've been a Christian for a long time, but you have not allowed the Holy Spirit to do the work in you that God wants to do. And you'd say, Lord, forgive me. I want, I want the power of the Holy Spirit to, to make me what you want me to be. And maybe today all this stuff has meant nothing to you. You're going through something that we don't know about. You're in a tough situation. You're in trouble. You're sick. I don't know. But Jesus is here today and He's here to help you. If you need someone to pray for you, I'll pray for you. We'll get the whole church to pray for you, whatever is necessary. As we sing, if you want someone to pray for you, just come forward and we'll do that.